Welcome to Grips Forum. Uh, this is the second forum this fall. My name is Izumi Ono. I teach international development policy here at the National Graduate Institute for Policy Studies, or GRIPS, based in Tokyo. I will be serving as a moderator today. We are very honored to invite a special guest, Mr. Ken Shibusawa. I am so grateful for his accepting his, to speak today, sparing super busy schedule. He's a man of vision, inspiration, and action, promoting inclusive and social sustainable business in Japan and around the world through finance. He is CEO and the founder of Shibusawa and Company, which is a strategic advisory firm for alternative investment, ESG, SDG alignment, and, and human resource development as well as Chairman of Commons Asset Management, which is a mutual fund dedicated to deliver long-term investment opportunity to the Japanese household. Notably, Mr. Ken Shibusawa has been just appointed as one of the 15 members of Prime Minister Kishida's flagships panel, a new capitalism panel, which is tasked to suggest a vision and actions for creating a virtuous cycle of growth and distribution for the post-pandemic economy and society. He is also a great communicator, writing and giving talks frequently for magazines and journals and internet media. This includes his podcast, Made with Japan. Mr. Ken Shibusawa comes from the family of Eiichi Shibusawa, his great-great-grandfather, who is highly regarded as a father of Japanese capitalism. Eiichi Shibusawa is very popular among Japanese, and actually his drama is now being broadcasted in NHK weekly history drama program, Sunday night, yesterday I also watched it. I am sure that Ken-san will explain in a minute, but let me explain briefly about Eiichi Shibusawa, especially for our international students. He was born in late Edo, Tokugawa shogunate time, and lived through Meiji and Taisho. And five years after Meiji Restoration, which took place about a little bit, um, 150 years ago, he founded the first bank in Japan in 1873, and around 500 companies. He was not only a super businessman, but also a very caring person and supporting the creation of about 600 organizations dedicated to social welfare and education. Shibusa's philosophy is that business and ethics must go in hand. So it is impressive that he was already practicing the spirits of SDG through the business. Today, Mr. Ken Shibusa is leading the social movement to create a 21st century capitalism. He strives to add new elements to what his great-great-grandfather achieved, encourage the Japanese private sector and the citizens to be proactively engaged in sustainable and inclusive business in a global scale, including developing countries. What does he mean for the 21st century capitalism and how he does see his role and also Japanese role? What are the challenges and problems to overcome? So let's listen to his talk, A New Model for a New Era Made with Japan. He will talk about, about probably 45 minutes or so, and then panel discussion will follow, inviting experts and group students. And after that, we will have an open Q&A session with a wider audience. Presentation and discussion in this session will be on the record. OK, so please welcome Ken Shibusawa. Please, Hi. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Ono, for such a gracious uh, uh, introduction. <clears throat> um, hello, everybody. My, my name is Ken Shibusawa. Um, thank you very much for inviting me to the GRIPS Forum. Um, my talk today, uh, believe it or not, will be talking about Japan entering into a new era. And in that new era, um, I think we're going to be entering into a very interesting um, part of the part of the Japanese uh, cycle of uh, history, and and I think um, everybody present today in this online uh, seminar 
is going to be actually, I think, a part of this new model, uh, which I phrase it made with Japan. And I'll go th uh, into more details a little bit uh, later. Um, but before, um, a little bit of um, some background information about the present state of the uh, Japan right now. Now, um, some of you <clears throat> may have catched a news about two years ago. Um, there is a gentleman called Jamie Dimon. Um, he's the president of a CEO of JP Morgan, which is a financial institution based in the United States. And I worked for JP Morgan here in Tokyo in the 80s. He was also the president or chairman, I'm sorry, chairman of the um, Business Roundtable, which is a, uh, a roundtable organization of corporate executives. Two years ago, uh, Jamie Dimon said the following that basically of all these years, we as corporate managers have been looking after basically the shareholders, shareholder value. But now from now on, we'll be have to be looking after not just the shareholders, but our customers, our workers, our uh, people that we have partnerships with, um, and also with society. So basically he was saying, not just shareholder capitalism, but we need stakeholder capitalism. And around the same time, the uh, Davos, the World Economic Forum, um, you know, th these are this is a forum where I think basically the the winners of capitalism come gather every year for this big uh, you know um, forum, and 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 they're saying the same thing that in this new world of new normal um, that there's a new trend of share stakeholder capitalism. If you also look through the papers, um, almost every day you see these three three letters E S G, which is E is environment, right? Uh, S is social, G is governance, and it's important to, for management to be looking after E S G. Uh, it's important for investors to be looking after this E S G. Basically, it's based saying that you're not just looking after the interest of the shareholder, but multi stakeholders at large. Um. Then, as uh, Dr. Ano mentioned earlier, um, our new prime minister of Japan, um, his basic policy uh, cornerstone is this new capitalism for Japan. So what is that telling us? It's telling us that right now, um, capitalism or Shihon Shigi, as we have known it, um, is under scrutiny, right? Um, many people believe that with capitalism, it just creates uh, the gap between the have and the have nots. It creates poor working conditions for workers. Uh, it destroys the economy. Um, basically, with capitalism, we cannot um, foresee or or to to design a a prosperous you know life for all in in our planet. Um, there's lots of disappointment with capitalism, um, not just here in Japan, but abroad. And also, it kind of feels like with the so-called, you know, young, younger, younger generation seems to be very disappointed with with uh, with this Shihon Shigi <clears throat> capitalism. So here enters this guy, um, Eiichi Shibusawa. And as Dr. Ono mentioned in the introduction, he's my grandfather's grandfather. And he's known as the father of Japanese capitalism. He was fairly well known um, because of that status, <laughs> um, but he became really well known um, two years ago when, when the government of Japan announced that the new uh, 10,000 yen bill, which will be issued from 2024, um, will have his face on it. And this is the well, I checked, but I think he's the probably the first um, businessman to be on a bill of, of the you know of a, of, a, of a currency of any any developed country. Um, I think the minister of finance I asked, and, and they checked, and they said there was a, a gentleman um, in 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 England, <clears throat> but he was on the backside of the bill. <laughs> um, and, but you know he's he's on the highest denomination bill here in Japan, and he's on the front front basically in the front. And this kind of triggered the television drama, um, Taiga Drama, <clears throat> which he's portrayed by this wonderful uh, actor. Um, 
and uh, he's you know and and it's 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 he's become really famous the last couple of years and, and as a result i've been asked to do many many uh, speaking engagements mostly in japanese but every once in a while i get to address uh, international global audiences uh, like yourself now he's known as the father of japanese capitalism because he as he was mentioned earlier he helped establish 500 companies uh 600 I would call social enterprises, um, including uh, educational institutions, uh, education for women, hospitals, uh, social welfare uh, institutions, I guess what we, we would call NPO, NGOs these days, but you know, around 600 of those. So, so he, was quite, he was quite a busy man. So, but he's known as the father of Japanese capitalism, but he never used this word, shihon shigi. He used this other word, gappon shugi. So, so, so what, what is, what is gappon shugi? Um, for, for, for international leaders, gappon, the character for, that looks like a house, means, means to be basically to merge, merge, awaseru, merge. Hon looks like a book, but basically means moto. So it's like the foundations of building something. So basically, gappon shugi means you're bringing uh, around, uh, you're bringing together resources, merging them together to create new value. This is this is the way he um, described the foundations or the origins of Japanese capitalism about 150 years ago, um, when he brought it back. From, from the Paris Exposition in 1967, around 67. That's, that's when he, he was introduced to the West. Um, he saw the, with the second uh, industrial revolution that the, the Western uh, economies was being, uh, was, had advanced very, very quickly. Um, and, he, and, and Japan was being left behind in, in almost 270 years of, of feudal law rule. Um, and, and he felt Japan needed to catch up very, very quickly. So uh, he lived in an era when Japan was going through tremendous change. <clears throat> there was the Great Reset, what we called Meiji Restoration, um, and then the, a new normal, basically with Japan uh, catching up to, to their Western um, peers uh, relatively quickly over you know, uh, uh, several decades. But so basically, in, in our present day language, he lived in the era, he lived in it during an era when there was the, the great reset and it was the new normal. And he achieved lots of lots of, uh, uh, well, achievements basically, right? And so um, why, why is he being brought back to the current, the present day Japan? And he's like you know, 100, 150 years ago, this guy, right? Um, so it, it kind of links to why Jamie Dimon, I think, is saying stakeholder capitalism. And I think it's, it's linked to what uh, Kishida, Prime Minister Kishida is saying about new capitalism. One is there's questions about the, you know, the, the capitalism. But the second point is where the current society, not just in Japan, but obviously globally, um, we're going through tremendous change. And that tremendous change is a lot of it is based on technology. Technology that we didn't have 20, 30 years ago at our fingertips. You know, something like this, for instance, right? It's, it's basically, a, a, you know, an industrial revolution, right, that we're going through. And so the times are different, the conditions are different, but, but there's similarities, right? Um, there's, lots of, there's lots of change. And with that change, people are expected to adapt to that new change. And, and H. E. Shibasawa obviously had that skill because he was able to produce 600 companies and 500 social enterprises so he had that mindset of when a society is changing what needs to be done to create new value but when a society changes people get sort of uh uncertain they, they feel a bit uncomfortable because of the change one other uh asset or, or uh I always do this in Japanese. So <laughs> this Japanese words pop up in my head instead of in English. But the another, another part of, of Shibasaichi's um, thinking is basically that um, any it's it's uh, it's thoughts and it's thoughts and sort of uh, thinking that really transcends time. 
So whether, you know, whether it was 100, 150 years ago today, there's these, some of these common values, common thoughts that tr tr transcends time. And so I think these are the two uh, uh, assets or values or thinking that age brings to, the, to, to our present day world. So um, moving on to his sort of thinking, any idea what this is? Um, for you guys from Asia, you'll probably need to know this a little bit more than the people from the other probably societies, but it's called the Analects of Confucius. <clears throat> uh, in Japanese, it's called Longo. Um, you guys know what this is? Uh, it's called the Soroban in Japanese, but in, in English, it's called the Abacus which is not a really a common used word, but, but it's, it's basically what it is, is the original handheld calculator, right? And so what, what, this is, what these two, what these thing two um, is, is basically depicting is the fact that Longo is representing the virtue, human virtue, morality, and the Sonovan is business or economics. And H. Shibasawa's thinking philosophy was that you need both. You needed both. So basically, it was longo to soroban, longo and soroban. <clears throat> so basically, my my interpretation of my great great grandfather's philosophy is all about this and. The difference between and and or, um, or it, it's very very uh, practical. It, it increases productivity, increases efficiency. Um, so we all need that, right? So for to manage a business, to analyze something, you need to know what's you know zero or one, digital, <clears throat> um, win or lose, that kind of thing. So it's it, it's very the power of or is very very important. But if you're just looking at the digital side, just or, um, you're you're just comparing the two and and moving forward. So basically, you're not creating new value there, right? With, with this power of and, with this power of and, with this power of and, <clears throat> is basically you're merging two together, <clears throat> yes, to create new new value. So, um, so basically, um, Longo and Soroban is basically you're starting out with something that doesn't match, but you're adding it together and you're creating new value. Um, and what, what does that lead to in sort of in, in common day, our sort of uh, words it is the fact that I think what Shibasai was saying 100, 150 years ago, when you're merging with Longo and Soroban, virtue and business, it's not just about doing good, which is important, but it's not just about doing good. I think it was more about sustainability. Why do I say that? It is because if you don't know how to use the soroban, there's no sustainability, right? But if you're just staring at the soroban all day, playing with it, you, you might trip over. On the other hand, let's say, oh, I, I you know, I, I read the longo every day. <clears throat> I don't I don't care about making money. <clears throat> I don't care about the business economy. I'm a virtuous man. Well, it's fine, but but when the world is changing and all you're doing is reading the longo, well, I don't think that's very sustainable. So what H. Sibasawa is saying here is not longo or soroban, but longo and soroban. Together, you need to together, right? It's like it's like this two wheels of this car moving toward the future. If one wheel is large and one wheel is very small. Well, guess what? You can't go straight, and, and you're going that route. You're going around in circles, right? Mm -hmm. And so, basically, I think what my great great grandfather H was trying to say in our present day language about a hundred years ago, when he was saying "long and sorova," is we need to be thinking about sustainability, not just your short term short term profits, um, not just about being moral moral, <clears throat> but you, you need you need both. Add it together, and that's how you have a sustainable world. Another. Uh, uh, concept that comes out of the Longo and Soroban is this concept of inclusion. And so a hundred and, you know, hundred, over a hundred years ago, uh, my great, great grandfather, Eichi, was basically saying that if only 1% becomes wealthy, 
and the 99% is left behind, well, then that happiness will not last in, in that situation. So, so basically, you know, he didn't, obviously he didn't call it inclusion back then. Um, but, but basically his message is the same as it was today, as it was back then. You need an inclusive society for it to be sustainable. But does that mean that this inclusive society, does that mean that everybody is the same? You know, everybody is the same. Is that, you know, in Japanese, we like the word minna. <clears throat> Everybody's the same. Well, I don't think that was his thinking. It was more about not sort of uh, equality or equity of uh, results, but more about equity of opportunity. So his thinking was that for a, in, his, in his time, for a new modern uh, state, new, new modern society, that no matter what was the, um, the, your, your, your upbringing or your, your birth, <clears throat> depending on level of society, you know, it, it, that, 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 that's, that, that's not inclusive, right? But, but it should be opportunity for anybody that was born in, in different sort of uh, situation. They should all have the, in, the opportunity to able to excel to what they have, you know, their, their um, self-esteem, their, their ability um, and to, to, to excel, to have a to fulfill, fulfilling life. So basically, I think he was talking about a inclusive society where there is equal opportunity for all. It might not be the equal results for all, but there should be equal opportunity for all. And so in that respect, you know, his, his words are about 100 and 150 years ago. But what do you think? I, I think it kind of leads up to this this, you know, ideal of leaving nobody behind, the SDGs. Of course, he didn't call it the SDGs, and he, you know, he didn't. He wasn't so <clears throat> articulate in, in 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 preparing 17 goals and 169 targets, obviously. But I think the 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 vision was the fact that for a prosperous world, um, for for the new coming years that you needed sustainability, the sustainable development goals. And with that, you, you need inclusion. So basically the message that he was saying back then rings true today. So with that little bit of background information and thoughts, I wanted to move forward to this new model for Japan. Is that possible? So <clears throat> our future. So Japan entered this, uh, uh, period called the Lewa back in 2019. And then from where we stand, when we look at the future, um, what do we see? We usually human beings went when then because future is, is, there's a lot of uncertainty about the future, right? <clears throat> and when there's uncertainty, basically humans tend to um, try to come up with the most simple answer quickly. It's kind of human nature. And so basically, when we think about the future, we kind of extrapolate from the present in a straight line. So back in 1980s, when Japan was booming, um, what kind of future were us, <clears throat> the Japanese people, thinking about the future? Well, they were, we were seeing the economic activity in, in, in front of our eyes, and, and we thought it was going to just keep on going on forever. <clears throat> and it did. Currently, uh, Japan has entered in this aging society. So when we think about the future, we think, oh, Japan's future, it, it's doomed. You know, it just it's going to keep on sinking and sinking and sinking. Well, I think, though, that history doesn't arrive in a straight line. And, and the hint actually comes from here. It says history doesn't repeat itself but it does rhyme. And this is a famous uh, quote um, by the famous author, American author, Mark Twain. Basically, it says, history doesn't repeat itself, but I interpret this rhyme as rhythm. So if you can notice a rhythm in the past, maybe that rhythm, that beat is going on into the future, right? 
So, so what is rhythm? Rhythm is basically a, a cyclical nature, right? So if you look at back in history of Japan, what kind of rhythm was there in, in Japanese history? Well, 1990, this was the peak of the bubble years. I was born in 1961. So from around when, around when I was born, for the next 30 years, um, we entered this age of prosperity. Um, Japan as number one, we were set back then. So this was the, a, a, um, the dec or three decades of basically prosperity. Okay, so what about the 30 years prior to that? Now, these are the war years. What is war? It basically, it's destruction, right? It's destruction of the old norm. And from that destruction, possibly there, there becomes a new norm. It was uh, an era of lots of destruction, lots of sadness. And so it should never, never be repeated. But, but because of that great reset we had in these years, that's why maybe, probably, the next 30 years, we prospered under the new norm. So then if you go back another 30 years, during this era, um, I think it was in 1904 and 1905, there was the Russo-Japanese War. In this war, basically what signaled was that a feudal state, emerging state called Japan, uh, basically had caught up to the West in a relatively a short period of time. Um, in this back then, in that era, probably I would say that the Japanese uh, uh, people was living in the most prosperous livelihood in the history of Japan up up until that era. <clears throat> so I would I would I would say this this was also actually a, a era eras or a, era I'm sorry era of prosperity. So if we go back another thirty years, what is this? <clears throat> well. This is the restoration year, Meiji restoration. Prior to this 30 years, roughly, um, it was we had almost 270 years of uh, feudal state called the Ed Edo period, right? And that was destructed. The old norm was destructed and the new norm arose, which is the modern economic social state of Japan as we know it today. So it's kind of a, it's not, it's very non-academic, <clears throat> obviously. Um, but if you kind of look back, you kind of see, you kind of see this rhythm basically from, from the major restoration, there was 30 years of destruction. And from that, um, the next 30 years, there was the years of prosperity. But what comes with prosperity is you get hubris, overconfidence, and maybe that was the reason. Maybe that was the reason the next 30 years, there was a period of destruction again. And everything was reset again. And then we entered the era of Japan as number one. So this was the, um, the prosperity years again. You know, I was in my 20s in the 1980s. Um, you know, and every once in a while, I, I, I would hear voices like this. Ah, we Japan, we have nothing to learn anymore from, from the West. Lots of hubris, lots of overconfidence in those years. And guess what? Uh, beyond 1990, um, we were told we're in the lost decade. And people said, no, 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 lost two decades. Um, some people are saying, no, Japan lost three decades. Well, I'm thinking, well, maybe if this rhythm is still going on, maybe it wasn't the era of lost decade but it's more about the era of destruction. And, and if this destruction, if this rhythm is still going on, well, well it looks like 2020 is kind of a, uh, was a starting point for the next stage, next era, which is supposed to be <clears throat> the era of prosperity. Now, <laughs> do you believe this or do you not believe this? <laughs> I'm sure you have you know, lots of thoughts about this, right? Um, but I was looking at something about 10 years ago, and I thought, huh, 2020 is going to be a very, very interesting time for Japan. It was going to be a, a flex point where prior to, 10, prior to 2020, the 10 years, 20, 30 years, it will be the, after the 10, 20, 30 years after 2020, it'll probably be a totally different 
society <clears throat> was what I thought about 10 years ago. And so I was looking forward to this around this period, you know, from around 10 years ago. <laughs> um, and in, in that process, we had the, uh, the, the Heisei period and we started the Reiwa period. Uh, we thought we were going to have the Olympics in 2020, it ended up we did in 2021 because of what? Corona, right? And what is what, what was the COVID crisis? Well, well, it basically, it really, really destructed the old norm, right? In the way we do things. You know, I don't know if I don't know if did grips do online seminars like this prior to 2020? Probably not. Um, how many times are you on online these days? Constantly, right? How about before? Zoom ex existed. I think I used it once prior to 2020, and now I use it, you know, several times a day, basically, right? <clears throat> uh, and, and just the way we work, um, everything basically was, it, it really changed a lot, right? And have you ever, you, do you remember that scene back in 2020 in, in the springtime when everything in the world just stopped at once? It kind of looked like a science fiction movie, right? <laughs> Um, so, I mean, to me, I, I, I think there, there, we went through this mon monumental sort of thing of destruction. <clears throat> and so, yeah, I think, you know, I think, I think I'm, we're still on course um, for Japan to enter into this new era, which should be the era of, quote, prosperity. Now, this prosperity, I think, will not be the same as the last prosperity. Um, so we need to probably be uh, redefine what prosperity means, but but I think we're kind of well. Put it this way: we're, we're we're entering a very very interesting time here in Japan, and as I said, I think you you all are a part of this. And, then, and what was I, I was staring at something ten years ago that that brought me to this brought me to this sort of uh, not conclusion, but this sort of uh, scenario for the future. What I was looking at was Japan's uh, demographic pyramid. This is Japan in 1930. So, you know, my father turned 92 last month. So when he was one years old, you know, look look how beautiful the pyramid was here in Japan. Um, the, uh, hit, the Showa period, I think it was in its fourth or fifth year. <clears throat> so, you know, very, very, very clean, clear, wonderful pyramid. The war ends in 1950 and we see a lot of uh, babies <laughs> being born. This is called the Dankai no Sede in Japan, um, or you know the baby boomers right here, right? Then another decade passes, and this is about the year when I was born. Um, this big sort of bulge <clears throat> kind of came back to, to its original place. But basically, Japan looked at this pyramid, and that's how we started the universal health coverage here in Japan, the national pension plan. This was put into place in 1961. <clears throat> so lots of young working generation supporting the elder generation. That, that was the social contract. That was the social design based on this population pyramid. Um, but do you know, do you know the, in 1960, <clears throat> the, the average, uh, what was it? The, like, like lifetime, uh, I can't think of the English word now. It, it's your longevity, longevity. <clears throat> the longevity, the average longevity here in Japan in 1960. Well, it was actually 65 years old. So basically, currently we live in a world, let's say that, you know, they're saying the longevity here in Japan might be 100. Yet, we're in a different era, but we're still using the same uh, universal health coverage system, the same national pension system that was basically based on this design. So, you know, we're at least stretching something or maybe possibly something's broken there, right? Um, 1970 is a very important um, year, I think, for Japan, kind of entering to important years because look at the baby boomers. They're now 20 years old which basically means they're out of college, they're or we're out of high school, <clears throat> they're in the workforce making money. And when you make money, well, you tend to spend it, right? So so this is this is the era around the time when Japan's economic engine started to really churn 
very, 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 very fast. Um, because and currently, you know, we're, we're in this um, uh, aging society and, and, and many people say, you know, Japanese, we need more babies here. Well, yeah, that's true. But, but in a sense, though, it's missing a point a little bit. It's not. It's not a point. It's not about having a lot of babies, <clears throat> but but it's having. It's about having a lot of people in the workforce, uh, working, making good money and using that money basically, right? And so that that that's that. This was the Japan's uh, success model uh, in the last or up 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 until present day. And if you look at the 1980s, well, the, guess what? The baby boomers in their 30s, and you get this other bulge here, right? This is the baby juniors. So basically the baby boomers are becoming families <clears throat> all over Japan. So when you become families, guess what? You tend to move, right? And you move, well, you buy new furniture, you buy new appliances, you might buy a new car. Um, so the 1980s was called the bubble years, but it wasn't all about the bubble, <clears throat> um, but there was really real actual demand driven by the household spending because the baby boomers were becoming families. 1990, well, Showa period ended and we entered a new period called the Heiwa period. Um, if you look back, think about the Showa period and say, well, the Japanese demo demographics, it's, it's a pyramid. Well, yeah, it was basically a pyramid. But, but if you look at this, demographics in the Heisei period from 1990, it doesn't look like a pyramid anymore. It's a sort of double bulge shape thing, right? That it just keep, that, that basically slide it upwards like this. So this is the 2020, <clears throat> the inflection point. Why I thought 2020 was very, very important was the fact that the Showa Japan was based on this population pyramid. Heisei Japan was this two double, double barreled <clears throat> bulge shape. Um, look what happens in Daiwa, Japan. Well, guess what? <laughs> um, there, there's a huge, huge transformation in the, in the shape of the demographics, right? Just went to this reverse pyramid. And you look at this 30 years from now, Japan, this picture, and you kind of go like, well, well, there's no way. There's no way that Japan can prosper under a situation like this. Well, yeah, if you based your assumptions and if you based all your um, models on the Showa period, the success of the Showa period, which was a pyramid shape, and if you extrapolate that into the future, well, obviously, <clears throat> um, it's going to be very, very difficult for Japan, yes? Um, but this is a Japan that it's going to actually happen because it's, 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 a, it's a demographic pyramid. You're not going to be able to change the demographics very, very rapidly so th this is the reality this is our uh foreseen future for japan but i think if you come back to 2021 you look and you gauge towards the future there's the foreseen future the future that happens for sure but there's also the unforeseen future what i mean by unforeseen future is that there's uncertainty and what i mean by uncertainty that it may go bad but it may go good. That's uncertainty, right? If you know it's going bad, that's not uncertainty. It, it's going to happen. <clears throat> but if it might go good, that's uncertainty. So for me, this unforeseen future for Japan, <clears throat> who are the prime actors for this new generation? Well, prior in the, in the Japan period, as, we, as I showed you earlier, it was the baby boomers for sure, right? Who are going to be in the driver's seat for new creation of new value in our in our Lewa Japan in the next 30 years? Well, I have hopes and uh, expectations <clears throat> that it's going to be actually this, this generation. People in their 30s, 20s, 10s, what we call the millennials uh, in, the, in, in the Z, right? The Generation Z. Why do I think that? Well, because... People in their 30s now, well, guess what? In 2050, you guys are going to be 60s, right? 
people in their 20s now they're going to be in your 50s and people in their te teens 10s they're going to be in their 40s so 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 obviously that in the next 30 years this generation is going to be the the, uh, the working <clears throat> you know uh, I guess in Japanese we would call genyeki sedai people actually working working population of, of the society but as we can see here the problem here for Japan that we don't have enough right well that's true but <clears throat> I, have a, I have a proposition proposition for you what what if what if this generation this generation millennium zets this theory i'm sorry not theory <laughs> generation z um they're um you guys are known as the digital natives what does that mean well basically it means that you don't know a world when the internet was not connected and, and what is the internet well there, there are some countries but for japan and for most of the world it basically means internet just goes it's cross-border right it, ha it has no borders so here's my proposition <clears throat> What if what if people here in Japan in their 30s, 20s, and 10s says, well, I live in Japan, I work in Japan, but hey, through the internet, through my imagination, I'm connected to the world. What kind of future do you think this, well, what kind of, I'm sorry, what kind of world do you think <clears throat> this gen gen generation will see if they see that they're connected to the world? Well, they'll realize that this generation is not a minority. It's the majority. The world is very, very young, right? Uh, places like uh, China, Korea, and I believe, I think it was Thailand as well. Uh, the population is going to be eight, start, the, start to age. So the population growth is not, not going to grow that much. But Indonesia, India, Africa, Africa is 1.3 billion people, right? It's the same as India, same as China. China won't be growing much in the next 30 years in terms of population. What about Africa? <clears throat> well, the Africa uh, by 2050, it's supposed to be uh, 2.5 billion or something like that, right? Almost double. <clears throat> the reason is the reason is that the medium age for Africans is apparently around 20. <clears throat> In Japan, it's around 48. <laughs> so, <clears throat> actually, <clears throat> this generation, if you use the internet, if you use your imagination, this generation is not a population minority. It's the population majority. And as a population majority uh, with new values for, with, uh, for the new world, um, I think there's, there's plenty of uh, a possibility for, for new value creation, new prosperity for, 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 the, for our future. Um, wh why do I think that? Well, because let's see. <clears throat> um, what do people in the same age bracket in many of these countries that I mentioned Indonesia, India, the African continent. What, what, what are they aspiring for? Well, I would think they want to get a job, they want to get paid, and so this to support their family, right? This is something here in Japan we think think of as normal. But so if you think of it in that perspective, the world has lots of growth possibilities uh, with this sort of normal normal growth based on this uh, population bonus. But many of these uh, countries are what we call emerging countries, developing countries, um, and there are lots of social issues, environmental issues, and that's where the SDGs come in, I think. I believe that here in Japan, it's not just the large corporations, it would include the SMEs, small medium enterprises, it would include the startups, it would not just include companies here in Tokyo, <clears throat> but all around Japan. Um, there's lots of combinations where I believe that they can take part to support a prosperous life for lots of people in lots of countries all around the world. And what if, what if, this is the big what if, right? What if <clears throat> lots, of, lots of people in this around the world <clears throat> in many, many different countries in saying, hey, 
my my livelihood, my daily life, my society, the sustainable societies there is because is, is Japan is at my side, side by side, helping to support that. What if? Well, if that happens, I think, I think here in Japan, even though our population is decreasing with here inside Japan, I think <clears throat> there's plenty of room for lots of prosperity here, here within Japan. So, you know, I, I'm being idealistic, obviously, but as I mentioned earlier, the power of and, <clears throat> it's basically striving in your imagination what could be done and actually getting it done. But you first you have to you have to believe what can be done, right? What should be done, and, and that was basically Shibasawa H's philosophy: what should be done for the society, and in, in in, in with that, how to get it done. And so, you can say, well, here in Japan, says, well, yeah, but we're comfortable here. You know, we 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 don't we we, we can just sort of let it slide. Yeah, we could take that road. But if we take that road here in Japan of just just doing nothing <clears throat> going forward, yeah, we'll have we'll have okay life. But what's what's going to be waiting for us in the future is just this foreseen future. Because we we're not able to capitalize on the unforeseen future. So standing in 2021, which future looks brighter? This <clears throat> foreseen future or the unforeseen future with, with with lots of uncertainty. So, in closing, <clears throat> I want to I want to propose this new model for Japan. Right uh, in the Showa period, we had this model called Made in Japan. Um, we were extremely profitable, and successful, basically delivering um, mass consumption needs of mostly uh, developed countries with mass production, right? <clears throat> Japan was so successful that some countries like the United States kind of got angry at us and started what we call bashing. <clears throat> so in the next period, next era in, in the Heisei period, Japan changed the model a little bit. We said, oh, I'm sorry, I'll make it in your country made by Japan. It was a very rational model change, I think. But Heisei period started with bashing. But 30 years later, as it was ending, it was a period where Japan got passed through. It was called Japan passing. So Heisei period started with bashing, ended with passing. So I'm hoping that the Lewa period, we're in a new era. <clears throat> and that new era is not just a model of made in Japan, not a model of just made by Japan, but as I mentioned, made with Japan. So, you know, what if, <clears throat> what if we can do this with, <clears throat> with, with many, many countries, with many, many people around the world? Well, I think there's, uh, like I mentioned, Lots of lots of room for for prosperity for not just for Japan as I mentioned but 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 core creating that prosperity with lots of people, lots of nations, all around the world. So that's my presentation. Um, I'm sure you have lots of questions, so I'm I'm open to any kind of questions you may have. Thank you very much.